I want you to watch this first. So this is him and Barry Weiss. And now you'll recognize after this who we have on the podcast today. Go ahead. And, and it, it was in this moment in 2016 that I realized people lose their minds when they don't like the result. And so what my paper showed, you'll see tomorrow, uh, like some of you, uh, was that, yes, we saw some bias in the low-level uses of force every day pushing up against cars and things like that. People tend to like that result. But we didn't find any um, uh, racial bias in police shootings. Now, that was really surprising to me because I expected to see it. The little-known fact is I had eight full-time RAs that it took to do this over nearly a year. When I found this surprising result, I hired eight fresh ones and redid it to make sure. They came up with the same exact answer and I thought it was robust and then I went to go give it and my God, all hell broke loose. It was a 104 page dense academic economics paper with a 150 page appendix, okay? It was posted for four minutes when I got my first email, this is full of shit. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. And I wrote back, how'd you read it that fast? <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> you are a genius. <laughs> and I had colleagues take me into to the side and say, don't publish this. You'll ruin your career. Mm. I said, what are you talking about? I said, what's wrong with it? Do you believe the first part? Yes. Do you believe the second part? Well, it's the issue is they just don't fit together. Hmm. We like the first one, but you should publish the, no the second one another time. I said, let me ask this. If the second part about the police shootings, this is a literal conversation. I said to them, if the second part um, showed bias, do you think I would, should publish it then? And they said, yeah, then it would make sense. And I said, I guarantee you I'll publish it. We'll see what happens. So it was, it was you know, I, I lived under, under um, police protection for about 30 or 40 days. I had a seven-day-old daughter at the time. I remember going and shopping for it because, you know, when you have a newborn, you think you have enough diapers, you don't. So I, I was going to the grocery store to get diapers with the armed guard. It was crazy. It was by the way, first time I saw this <clears throat> reaction, you know, to this, it, it, it takes a lot of courage and bravery and brass to do this. Keep in mind, 2009, I think you're one of the top 100 Time Magazine. And at the time, if you're 45 today, you're, you're what, 30 at that time, 30 years old to be on time. I mean, that's a prestigious place to be. When you were reporting this, how much did you think about this could potentially affect my career? Not at all. I think I was just naive, man. Uh, you call it brave. Maybe I was just dumb. But I, I didn't think about it at all, honestly. Um, and I have an attitude that if you tell me I can't do something, I'll show you that I can. And so when people said, oh, you can't publish this, it, it, it wasn't coming from a place where they cared about me or cared about the people in the neighborhoods who I've been working for since I got to Harvard. And so my basic view was, look, the people in the street know the truth. And, and we can't keep lying to them, right? Like, I mean, I, I said the same uh, different time in that clip you showed. I, 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 I say all the time, like, the conversations we're having in academia don't hit the ground in the neighborhoods that I care the most about, right? Like, if you go to my old neighborhood, and we talked about Louisville before mm -hmm. the show, you go to Louisville and call someone BIPOC, they'll punch you in your face, mm -hmm. right? Like, that's not, they don't, they don't care about those kinds of things. And so... I've always had the view that if this was your family, you'd tell them the truth, even if it was a hard thing to say. And you'd find a way to say it with empathy and with love, but you wouldn't lie to them. And so the idea that you would hide results because you are afraid of what people would say or how they would feel or how it would affect your career, it's just never been about me. It's about the folks in the neighborhoods we're trying to help. What, what are you seeking? Because, you know, sometimes... Um, everybody's seeking something else. Like for me, you know, I have a certain life that I've lived and I'm trying to get to the bottom of a certain truth for myself that to, to maybe tie a certain uh, uh, issue in the past, conflicts that I was trying to overcome. What, what answer are you trying to get to the bottom of for yourself? 
I'm going to put every ounce of effort I have in trying to make sure that uh, kids, black or brown, don't have to endure what I did to get here. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make the journey worth it, right? So if you'd come to me at age whatever, 15, it's one of the loneliest days of my entire life. I walked out of the Denton County uh, Correctional Facility. I just visited my father in there. And uh, I remember that conversation because he was bragging about how comfy the, the slippers were that they gave the people in jail. And I thought, that's like the dumbest shit I've ever heard. I walked out of there, and I looked up, and I'll, I'll never forget it. It was this, one of these beautiful blue Texas guys. And I've never felt more alone in my life. I was 15 years old. Where was I going to go? There was no one else. I, I didn't even know who my mother was at that time. My grandmother was here in Florida. And if you'd come to me at that time and you'd said, look, I know uh, things seem pretty impossible now, but these experiences are going to make you uh, impervious to the BS uh, when it comes to race in America. And, and you are going to be able to analyze data and maybe make some progress for, for uh, the next generation of kids. I'd like to think that I would have taken on that challenge. But if you'd come to me during that day and said, if you can get through this, we can have Chardonnay at 1030 at Harvard University and hang out. We can talk about Plato. I would have said, no, thanks, man. Could you just get my dad out of jail? And so for me, it's, it's, you're right. I mean, uh, when I first got to Harvard, I, I felt guilty. I had to figure out, I, I got to do something, right? And I, and I feel like the time, I feel like the clock is running out. Uh, so I'm in a big hurry to make a big difference. Were you uh, in Armenian, there's a phrase that I couldn't stand they would say to us, you know, because of where we were at. Mechka, mechka, mechka. Like, oh, poor, poor. Poor Patrick, poor Bed Davids, and I couldn't stand that phrase. When you went to Harvard, did you, did they treat you like, you know, hey, you know, you came from here and poor you, let us treat you this, or were you treated like anybody else and, you know, the standards and expectation per, to perform? And if yes or no, did it do anything to you? It's interesting. Um, I don't know if anyone said poor me, um, but I do believe they looked at me different. Um, I felt like they looked at me like I was um, an exception. Um, someone had beat the odds. Um, someone who was curious. Um, the New York Times did a profile of my life in 2006 or so. And I remember, you know, colleagues coming up to me and go, man, you sure you want all that in the newspaper? Because they talked about my family, you know, dealing drugs and blah, blah, blah. That, that, you know, I wasn't trying to hide anything mm -hmm. at that point. Um, and, but the, the idea that I was an exception used to really piss me off, yeah. Because this is not about helping a few of us beat the odds, right? That's insulting. This is about unfettered competition so we can change the odds, right? This is about figuring out how we give people real opportunities so that they can do for themselves, Right? I don't need you to pluck a few of us and pat us on the back. What we need to do is figure out how do we find hidden talent wherever it lies in, in, uh, across the globe. It's interesting. So let's, let's go back to the study. And, you know, you've shared a little bit about your background for, you know, some folks who don't know. Um, the study that you did, this specific study in 2016 that, you know, we, sh we played a clip for earlier, when you're going through this process of with this study, were you yourself expecting those numbers or were you yourself like surprised as hell when you saw it? And then how did that change your perception and opinion of things? No one was more surprised than me. Right. Like, I'm not proud of it, but I don't really like the police that much. Right. Like if I I'm going to the airport after this, if they pull me over, I'm gonna be nervous, man. <laughs> like, I don't, it's not I think a lot of yeah. us would be. Um, so I figured this was going to be the easiest thing in the world, right? People were out protesting and stuff like that after Michael Brown, but, you know, flying to St. Louis and, and locking arms, uh, was just not my thing. I'm not saying it shouldn't be done. It's just not my thing. So I thought, here's what I'll do, uh, to help. 
I'll re- I will figure out empirically what's really going on because we had only seen a few videos at that point. And uh, I remember going to a colleague of mine and saying, here, let's, uh, I'm going to study the police and here's an idea. And what he quickly told me was, you don't understand anything about the police. So how are you going to be going to figure out what's going on with race and policing in America? Um, so I embedded myself in police departments, and we can talk about that if you want at some point. But uh, I was extremely surprised. I was sure that there was going to be bias in police shootings. Uh, as the clip said, when I got the results back, I hired new uh, research assistants to do it over again um, just to make sure. But once you have the results, once you have what you think is the truth, given your data, there's no other choice but to go out with it and, and, and try to educate people on what the data actually says. And what is the data? If you can just actually give us the data, what was in the data? What we found was that on lower level uses of force, so when it comes to pushing, up, pushing someone up against a car, pulling a gun, putting handcuffs on them but not arresting them, things like that, there were large racial differences in um, police use of force. So black uh, uh, civilians are 50% more likely to have force used on them in any given interaction. Even when the police say they're perfectly compliant and they're not arrested and there's no contraband, et cetera, they're still more than 20% uh, 20 more likely than white civilians to have force used on them. But when it came to lethal use of force, um, shootings, we found absolutely no racial bias in that in any way, shape, or form. And our data, I believe, is a lot better than what has been um, uh, discussed in the popular press because they're looking at kind of s- statistical snapshots. They're saying, well, the fraction of black people who are shot by the police is 50%, and they're only 13% of the population. Ergo, it must be discrimination. Sorry, I don't know if they forgot Statistics 101. That's not how it works. Right. What we did was say, look, here is um, a, two people um, are in a situation with police. Their behavior is the same. The other conditions on the ground are the same. Uh, the police decides to shoot one and not the other. Is race a factor? In other words, accounting for everything else about that situation, does race predict whether or not a police officer will pull the trigger? And the answer emphatically is no. And that is the result that uh, caused uh, panic in a lot of people. Most people like the first result. What did it do to you? What did it do to you? I mean, because there's there's certain, uh, you're seeking the truth, because that's what you keep saying with Barry Weiss, right? I'm trying to get to the truth. And I love what you said, and you said it again earlier today. You said, uh, uh, in one of the documentaries I watched, I think it was like 26, 27 minutes where it says, I'm not trying to beat the odds. Cause one guy, what does it feel like Roland that you beat the odds? You're like, I'm not trying to beat the odds. I'm trying to change the odds. Right. But individually, we're also going through a journey. There's a difference between saying, guys, look what I found. You will not believe this report. Look at what I found. But what am I going through? Yeah. What are you going through with the life that you live? Uh, at that time, I, um, I was not aware of what was going to come. So uh, when we had the results, um, we uh, pursued two tracks. One, you obviously publish it, and we published it on a topic in Alex Journal. Great. Seven people read it. Uh, (laughs) Maybe six. Uh, The second path is we wanted a more popular version of, of the article, so the New York Times wrote about it. And... Uh, for me personally, uh, when people respond, you know, people send me an email and say, hey, your paper's crap, or hey, your paper's great, I do all I can to return every single one of those. And so for me, I sat for days and uh, returned thousands and thousands of emails from regular old Americans in Kansas and in Idaho and in Chicago who said, I don't know if I believe this or not, but thank goodness there's actually data and we can actually have a debate about it. And we went back and forth. And that, that's kind of what I do for a living, right? I'm a, I'm a professor. I, I'm supposed to be teaching, not just in the classroom. But if you release a paper like this, this is what you do. So what happened to me? I got a chance to teach. Um, and if you, if you uh, remember that time, 
I didn't do any other press. This wasn't about me out there thumping my chest trying to be on whatever news channel saying, hey, look what I found. We put it out there, and then I, over email and other means, tried to communicate directly with people about what the results were about. But what I'm, what I'm, trying, what I'm asking is, what did it do to you? So, so because uh, uh, life, okay, I grew, I grew up in Iran, and I see 10,000 men marching, flagellating their backs, screaming, Madik Bad Omri called Death Upon America. America must be an evil empire. Then I watch Rocky IV, and, you know, Rocky and Drago are fighting. Drago, 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 and then Rocky, Rocky, and if you can change, he can change, anybody can change. I'm like, man, maybe we can bring Soviet Union and us and unify and realize we have a lot in common, right? And I'm like, wait a minute, but that's a movie, that's fake, this is real, America must be evil. Then you go to Germany, live at a refugee camp, parents get a divorce, mom says, because that entire family were communists, their, their Bible was Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto, rich people are greedy, dad... On the other side, as an imperialist, they believe poor people are lazy. And then I get into the military, I get out, I get into sales, and then I see the person that bitches the most, work the least, the guy, I'm like, wait a minute, what's going on? And it changed my opinion hmm. about economy, about work, about politics, about capitalism, about who to vote for, about who not to vote for, about who's manipulating, about who wanted to use me, about who wanted to keep me poor, hmm. about who wanted to kind of make sure I didn't figure out the mm. secrets to life that I can go out there and figure myself out about how they use fear to control, to keep your mouth shut. All of these things that I'm going through as a kid, right? And I'm like in my twenties and I'm like, Oh, wait a minute. This doesn't make any sense. What did you go through one on one? Not anybody else. Did it change anything away from what you witnessed in your life to go back and say, man, I remember Bobby back in high school. Unfortunately, they sold him. He bought it. He's dead. Now he was smarter than me in math. If he knew what I knew, he could have been, that sucks. So it was really the social, economic. It wasn't a skin color, but he was convinced it was a skin color. Why do we buy? Did you go through that yeah. evolution yourself? Of yeah, of course, of course. Uh, on a couple dimensions. One, uh, I was disappointed in social scientists. Um, I didn't realize there was so much politics in academia until that point. I really thought that we were out there, all of us, searching for the truth. I mean, we sit in these seminars and we beat the crap out of each other's ideas and papers, and it's all about trying to get to a place of what's correct and what's not. And to see uh, people who uh, I respected for years lose their way because there was, there was a result they didn't like. It was very shocking to me. Can I, can I ask a question, Roland? Yeah. So, so you do this research, you have a fact check, double check, then the truth is there. Why do you think that truth is such a threat to your colleagues, to the powers that be, going up the ladder to Harvard, to, to just the powers that be? It's such a threat. Why, why do you think that is? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't think the results themselves were a threat to them. I think they wanted to be on the right side hmm. of a particular issue. I, I, I never thought of people as, sh as sheep until that moment. Oh, wow. You know, it's crazy you say that. Uh, my entire life growing up, I don't have a four-year, I don't have a two-year, I don't even have an associate's. I had a one-point GPA in high school. I was a math guy. I love calculus, love math analysis. I can do math all day long. Had no interest for anything else. Troubled teenage, you know, kids got divorced, all this stuff. So so my route was I'm going to go to the Army. He went to the Air Force. He was the airman of the year in the Air Force. So we're military. Tom's dad was a rocket scientist, literally <laughs> was a rocket scientist. I'm not saying this as a – so Tom went. He became a professor, adjunct professor at Pepperdine, at Biola. He's probably had $2 billion of exits and raising money, so he goes to Silicon Valley. So when Steve Jobs and Bill Gates do that interview that 300 people worldwide are invited to be there, he's one of them. That's Tom. Tom's background is that. So Tom is academia – more coming from more coming from this side. But a, but a part of it, I remember when I went to Harvard and for their OPM program, Owner President Management Program, you have to do $10 million a year to be able to go there. And I qualified. So I'm like, Tom, Tom's like, Pat, just go. I'm like, Tom, I, we're running a company. He's like, Pat, I'm telling you, go. We got the company. We're good. Tom, I hired Tom to be the president of our, our company at the time. So I go for three weeks. Now, let me tell you what time it is when I go there. 
I go during the debate between Hillary Clinton and Trump. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I go to this, to this uh, 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 chow hall. I thought chow hall, like, you know, military. military. We yeah, chow, but this is a different chow hall. It's C-H-A-O. It's, a, it's an Asian man that gave $100 million to Harvard. <laughs> chow hall. It's named after him. <laughs> oh, Mr. Wow. Chow. That's okay, fun. chow hall. Yeah. So I go to chow hall. There's 300 people from Harvard watching this debate. And I'm thinking, Jeldi would, Vinny, okay, smile. My bad, my bad. Seriously, do it my fast. Bad, bad. You're doing it slow, so we can't hear it. So I'm, I'm at this chow hall place, and I'm hearing these guys. And I sit in the sidelines, say nothing. <laughs> and it's the line, because you'd be in jail, right? Oh, man. Aren't we glad that a man like this isn't in the White House making the decisions and having control of whatever she says, because you'd be in jail, right? And boo! I'm like, it has to be 50-50. Now. I'm like, I want to see 300 people in our room. It's got to be 60, 40. <laughs> I'm like, Trump just said something. The Trump people should root for him. Nothing. So this kept going for the two hour debate. Not one, 300 people are in Chow Hall. Not one person got up. The OPM program is a three year program. I'm supposed to go every year for three weeks. I go to my main person. I said, are you guys, one? do you believe in debate? Of course we do. <laughs> Is this a place where you guys entertain opposing ideas? Of course we do. <laughs> Can I ask why 100%? So what do you think about Trump? He says, oh, he's a, he's a, you know, he's a, he's a, he would be a terrible president. I said, why is it 100% of you all agree that Trump's a bad person? Why is that? I thought you guys are about debate. I said, I can't come back to the school. Never went back. Hmm. Wow. I couldn't go back. Hmm. The reason wasn't, be I enjoyed debate. I want to sit down at, with Stephen A. Smith and I were talking two days ago. Let's sit down and have a great conversation together. I love it. Hmm. Yesterday I had a, a friendly debate with the lawyer for John Barnett, who is the lawyer for the Boeing whistleblower on, hey, he committed suicide. Some of the stuff just doesn't add up. And company lost $50 billion on valuation. No, he just loved Boeing. It was nothing bad. Like, I don't know, I got some questions. I'm curious, right? Let's have the banter. But when I saw that, I said, this is not a university. They're full of shit. Now, this is my opinion. You don't have to have that position. This is my position. Why? And then COVID takes place. And then you saw how extreme they got. And they say they're against uh, for education. And then parents asked and said, hey, I know I'm spending this kind of money for my kids to come and stay in campus. Now you don't want them to be on campus. You want them to come from home. Can we get some savings? Nope. Harvard. Degree is worth the whole price. You got $60 billion in endowment. <laughs> so all of these things made me go from, you're from Harvard? Oh, my God. How are you, Dr. Roland G. Fryer? You're from Oxford? You're from this? You're from that? I tell yeah, you know what? I don't know if you guys believe in debate. That's where my mind went to because what I witnessed on Harvard campus for those three weeks. Hmm. I could be wrong. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it, it, it really depends on... on the individual faculty members involved. It really does. I mean, you know, I, I, I ask myself all the time, who is Harvard? What, what does that even mean? Right. And if you were to come to my class, for example, uh, I teach an undergraduate class that talks about issues like how much discrimination there is in the world, whether or not um, what education policy should we have? Let's what what do we know empirically about the effects of slavery on current outcomes? And you have fierce debate in that class. And, um, and I think you'd be proud of what the students are doing in terms of different viewpoint diversity. If you go to other places on campus, it might be different. I don't know. So um, it, it's, a, it's a big place, and, uh, but it doesn't surprise me what, what you've described. Rob, can you pull up what I just texted you? I just literally Googled this right now because you know how you can go and find out and say uh, – the article came out saying what percentage of Twitter executives and employees donate to the left or the right? And then it was like 99%. I'm like, <laughs> what? And then have you ever seen this chart or no? Rob, can you pull up that chart? Cause that's public. It's not hard to kind of find. It's all over Twitter and we have it. And then, uh, uh then I said, okay, let, let me go a little bit further. Th this is different. This is just, let me sh go sh show to the top. Harvard corporation members donated heavily to Democrats ahead of the 2022 midterms. Look how much of it is red. You got the Pritzker family, heavy duty. You got the Wells. There's zero red. There's zero bipartisan. The only person that is is Paul Finnegan and slightly red, all blue. This is pretty much 95% is all blue. So now 
Does it mean blue is right and red is wrong? <laughs> Does it mean conservative pol policies and living a conservative life fiscally is a bad thing? Does it mean maybe if I go to Harvard, I come out, I have to be a liberal if I come out of Harvard. <laughs> because if all these smart people at these places, God forbid, if I'm a conservative at a place like that, I make it ousted. You know, and I, I know you have a, a very, very good relationship with Claudine Gay. I you know you guys are best friends. Yeah, barbecuing, and, hanging and, out. You yeah, know, it. you were having breakfast with her this morning, which is great. <laughs> but so you, you hear a Claudine Gay, and you come out and you report this win in 2016, 2017. I just I Google literally right now to see your article about you know New York Times star economist, you know writes this article, and that was in 2017. Okay, whatever it was, right, and then. They're telling you what you're doing. The next one comes out. Star economist at Harvard faces sexual harassment oh, yeah. complaints. And I went through your tweets. There was nothing about your tweets that was sexual. They were actually funny. You're like, maybe if I didn't spend so much time studying stuff, maybe I'd be better in sex. Yeah. I'd love to go to France. I actually looked at your tweets. Text. The, not te <laughs> your text. I'm like, yeah, I mean, we all probably talk like that every once in a while, right? So then they come after you. Then um, Claudine Gay, uh, behind closed doors, is trying to talk to Larry Bobo. I don't know who it was, trying to get you to lose your tenure. <laughs> this is pre her being president. And do you kind of sit there and say, dude, am I, are we not protected? I mean, am I not, are you guys not trying to target me? Did that thought at all cross your mind that this school doesn't like some of the position? And Claudine Gay, maybe. The average person on the left would say Claudine Gay should probably defend you, right? If you're really about, he should be on my side, right? <laughs> when you were going through that, and obviously I'm not telling the whole story, yeah. but when you were going through that, how are you processing all that it was experience? Hard. It, it was hard to process it. And, and what I focused on was um, what I could do better, really, right? Like I don't, when anything happens in life, you have a choice. You can either look in the mirror or you can look out the window. And the first thing I do is look in the mirror. And um, you're right. The, the, you know, there's, it's debatable whether or not uh, 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 telling jokes is worth uh, that kind of penalty. But uh, maybe I shouldn't have told them, right? And so the first Do you first really thing believe I, that, though? Do you really believe that? Yeah, the first thing I did was I went to executive coaching because I didn't understand Right. Like the I know it's maybe hard for some people to think, well, you're a Harvard professor. You must know better. We talked about how I got to be a Harvard professor and nowhere in that journey was management training. <laughs> um, nowhere in that journey was, hey, you know, you, I I am very, very casual. Right. So when I think we're friends, we're friends. And so I feel like we can talk about anything. If you have Thanksgiving at my house that I feel like we can banter in any way we want. Mm -hmm. It's just the way I roll. Mm -hmm. And so it never dawned on me that, you know, for, for years I had lots and lots of students in my house for Thanksgiving. And so those students I had a different type of bantering with than, than ones that didn't. And so I treated my, uh, you know, workplace for people who, you know, I knew well, like my living room, and I shouldn't have done that. Um, and I don't know if it... Uh, truly hurt someone. They said it, you know, a few years later, they said it did. And if it did, my God, I'm sorry, because that's not, you know, that's not what I had intended. So it's really not about what I believe. It's about um, uh, what could be and whether or not I can actually change my behavior. So that I've done. Now, um, what was I thinking during that whole process? It was, it was very, very confusing. And I had to figure out if I could actually do the work I wanted to do at a university. Um, and more importantly, I had to figure out because the, the, the world was treating me very differently from Monday to Tuesday during that time in my life, how I could still be on this mission to make, to have impact. Um, how was I going to get the work done that I needed to get done? Uh, if I couldn't publish here or talk about academic papers there or have research assistants or what have you, how was I still going to make a difference? And um, that's what I was truly focused on. Yeah. I mean, y you sound very nice. <laughs> it's not and, about and, nice, and, man. And, I want to be effective. Yeah. No, I get that. But to me also, from the outside, do you think the approach they took to get it public and the way it was 
uh, uh, was a form of trying to embarrass you a little bit? Was it a form of making an example? Because that could have been handled privately, you know? Yeah, it felt personal. Okay. It felt personal. But again, what I... <laughs> And maybe I'm being, uh, you call it nice, uh, but what you going to do about that, right? Like back in the neighborhood I grew up in, people would say, man, fuck school, man. These people, people discriminating. What the hell are you going to do about that? You got a choice. You can either get up and work your butt off and see what comes of it, or you can sit here and talk about what you can't do. And so during that time, yes. I could have sat around, I'm not sure anybody would have listened during that time, but I could have sat around and said, woe is me. It's not my style. I've never done that. Never. And I wasn't going to start then. What I had to figure out is, I got two kids in private schools. How are we going to make that work Basic, out? Yeah. Right? I got kids, my kids, you know, I, I grew up hating rich kids, and now I got two of them. They, they like Brie, Brie and shit. How am I going to afford Brie? <laughs> like my, like, like I got, those are the problems I got. So funny. <laughs> right? like, like. I can no longer remain in today's Democratic Party. Tulsi Gabbard says she is no longer a Democrat, a potential Tulsi Gabbard VP. Where we are being told that we just have to comply and go along with whatever they say. American people. People uh, are smarter than this. However, we must remain vigilant to recognize their propaganda for what it is, pure lie. Unfortunately, we live in a time where free speech is under attack. Whatever they say goes and we, we have to just fall. And the people who suffered under your reign as prosecutor, you owe them an apology. <laughs> Taking on Kamala Harris on a debate stage before, I would look forward to doing that again. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.